These are in listen-only mode. Hi there, welcome. I'm Pam Heggie. I'm the Vice President of Marketing and Product Development here at Worth Point, and uh, we're pleased to be hosting this timely Father's Day event. Mantiques, manly collecting comes out of the man cave. A couple of quick notes before we get started. First and foremost, please feel free to uh, submit your questions through the chat button or the questions button there that you have. We'll get those in front of our guest speaker during the Q&A at the end of the presentation. We are recording the presentation and we'll make that link available to you all in a follow-up email. And we also have some special gifts for you today, everyone attending. Um, the, uh, the first being that Krauss Books is offering May Antiques uh, for just $16 with free shipping. And then secondly, we've also set up a special discount code that gives you $3 off monthly membership to Worth Point. Uh, and then lastly, one lucky participant today will receive an autographed copy of Mantiques and one year membership to Worth Point. We'll go through all those details uh, at the end of the presentation. So thanks for attending. Let me tell you a little bit about Worth Point. Uh, Worth Point is the largest resource for finding, valuing, and pricing antiques, arts, and collectibles. You know, we have a lot of members on, uh, on this webinar today and we thank you for that. Uh, we have a, more than 200 million sold for prices from about 350 data sources including uh, heritage auctions uh, in our Worthopedia. Add to that another uh, 60,000 makers marks in our Worth Point marks uh, database and finally more than 4,600 articles and uh, over a thousand digital books from category experts in our digital library. And all of that's available to you at your fingertips uh, through the desktop or through our mobile app. So uh, we encourage you to visit worthpoint.com if you haven't done that yet and uh, take a look around. And now uh, to the reason that everybody's dialed in today. Let's talk a little bit about uh, who is Eric Bradley. So. Uh, Eric is the author of Mantiques, A Manly Guide to Cool Stuff, which is the focus of our webinar today. He is also a public relations associate at Heritage Auctions and editor of the annual Antique Trader Antiques and Collectibles Price Guide. He definitely knows his stuff when it comes to collectibles and certainly when it comes to Mantiques. I'm certain he's heard that defining Mantiques question uh, from his wife, which is, what is that, and what are you going to do with it more than once? So, uh, Eric, I welcome you. Well, thank you, Pam. Thank you. I appreciate the, appreciate the opportunity today, and uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't say thanks to Gregory Watkins also um, at Worth Point for the opportunity and the introduction, um, the uh, invitation. Um, it's very thoughtful, and uh, um, it's a great opportunity to talk about a really interesting kind of kooky area that's that's growing out of uh, the collectibles hobby these days. Um, so uh, the, the book came out about uh, a month ago and uh, the response has been, has been pretty strong, um, especially among um, mainstream media. And ma over and over again people ask, what is a mantique? A lot of people don't know what it is. They, uh, they may not have a lot of experience in the collectibles hobby in general. Um, but the word mantique conjures up a whole lot of different ideas, from rusty and crusty to smelly and, and uh, you know, strange things that only uh, a few people would, rather, would like to have hanging around their house. Um, so early on in, this, in the process of planning for the book, uh, I proposed that idea or that question to the people who have opened up their own stores um, catering to antiques. And time and time again, uh, people say, you know it when you see it. Um, a lot of people, a lot of the sellers of antiques and collectors of antiques say that it ranges from the ridiculous to the sublime. And that's really true if you, uh, if you look at some of the collections that are out um, in the world these days. Um, Another uh, aspect of antiques is that they're funny. Um, there's some sort of a humor aspect to them. Um, uh, maybe they're, uh, they're something that you inherited um, that was kind of quirky and unusual. Um, but usually uh, the, the, the antiques are something that sparks conversation. 
and uh, and stands out as being unusual from the rest of the antiques that you see in a shop or mall, or even in your collection. Um, and antiques too, they also kind of tie to man appealing activity. So you might see them tied to you know, football or sports or um, fishing or hunting. Um, it, it kind of depends. But also you see uh, antiques start to rise up uh, from more uh, creative things. Things that, that were created specifically from odds and ends, maybe found object sculptures that stand alone as art objects. They start to transcend their original needs and uh, they become more decorative. You know, lamps made out of minnow, minnow buckets, things like that. <laughs> it gets kind of kind of crazy from there. Um, why there's so much interest now, uh, on some level, I think uh, calling something an antique is less intimidating to new collectors. And you see, I saw that over and over again when you talk to the mantic sellers themselves. Um, when you're trying to, to find a new way to market uh, an old product, um, literally and figuratively, um, the word mantique reduces that barrier for a lot of people and gets them interested and um, is, less, is less formal. It doesn't mean that that affects the cost necessarily, but it's kind of a, it's kind of a way to it breaks down a psychological barrier that maybe new collectors have when they start looking at older things. So, and now that we're kind of lingering in this in this uh, long, you know, hard slog of an economic recovery, people are still turning to affordable sources for entertainment and interesting things. So, uh, that's one of the reasons why Mantiques, the world of Mantiques is kind of growing these days. Um, the people who are promoting the business and promoting this area are directly tied to the items themselves. You see the big wave of uh, reality TV shows um, that are focusing on a variety of uh, mantis from uh, advertising signs to oil cans. You see on American Pickers and on Pawn Stars. And it starts to, sh what those shows did, and if you look, the growing number of these shows are growing, it, it's encouraging people to look at antiques as tools to collect. And we didn't always have that. Uh, leading up into the late 2000s, um, the antique business has seen um, a, a huge slide. But now we're seeing a, a revival of sorts. Even if it's on the peripheral, periphery, and even if it's on the lower end, it's still relevant. Um, but it also kind of leads into how changes in how people are collecting. So this is a slide from Google Trends. And you know, Google, uh, you know, we're always on the on the verge of believing that Google's going to, you know, be able to read our thoughts within two years. But right now they're busy cataloging all of our searches. So when you go to Google and you start to search something, they're saving all those terms and they're starting to show trends. What you see here is a trend in how people search for things to collect. So the blue term, the blue line, um, represents the word antique. But the words retro and vintage, you see there are on a on a market upswing. Um, the word, you know, mantiques goes here, which just kind of bounce on the bottom because it's really, really fresh and it's more of a, um, a very breakout term. But it is growing. We're seeing a big, uh, big difference in that. So the way people are collecting and the way people are looking for things and even advertising things for sale is changing. And, uh, you know, marketing items and collecting items as mantiques kind of folds into this new, this new approach. So you see... So as, as those changes take place, you start to see it re reflected in the greater mainstream media. And when Mantiques came out, um, the response is surprisingly strong among uh, mainstream media in an area that I really didn't quite expect. And that's uh, really upper end and even uh, ladies and women's um, uh, marketing areas and uh, like the, the magazines. So you see the telegraph right there, um, forget man, forget antiques, the latest trend is mantiques. Uh, Four Seasons Magazine that reaches 1.1 million luxury uh, visitors to the global luxury resort chain. Uh, they wrote about it, um, and even Allure um, talked about some of the different collecting areas. It really surprised me that, that women and women's areas, uh, women's media, was really uh, interested in this topic. Uh, but I think it kind of kind of shows that it, there's a shift taking place a little bit. 
Um, so and one of the questions that I most often ask when I give interviews is, what are the types of Nantiques that are out there? And without, you know, uh, it's, it's kind of hard to dissect it too far because it's almost like dissecting a joke to figure out why it's funny. You know, it kind of goes back to what we said. You know it when you see it. But generally, these are the types of Nantiques that we see uh, that are rising in popularity as opposed to others. So you've got like scientific and uh, mechanical uh, collectibles, uh, hunting and fishing. I didn't abbreviate that just because I grew up in uh, rural Michigan. It just didn't fit on the line. Uh, but uh, you see uh, tools and toys and rock and roll, uh, men's luxury brands, and, um, and novelties too. Uh, and so uh, it's a good example, um, the Apache beer can you see here uh, was sold a couple years ago. Um, it now holds a record as the world's most expensive beer can, it sold for $24,000. So that's, a, that's an important distinction that people often make. They often uh, make, the, make the correlation that Nantiques is, is junk. Well, yes it can be, but it can also be uh, significant dollars, we're talking real dollars. And in a way, Nantiques are kind of redefining what's collectible. Now this brass, you know, it's a firefighting cannon might not have been collectible uh, just a few years ago. It may have been sold off for scrap, but you see that with a greater, greater insistency, more odds and odd and unusual things are in, are in demand. So you're starting to see vintage industrial equipment um, pick up, and uh, it appears at shows and starting to appear at mainstream auctions in, uh, in decorator auctions. And um, so it's starting to starting to shift. And when you see the demographic shift that comes along with these items, you start to see a bridge start to form. Um, you know, there's a there's this uh, it also kind of breaks down the the stereotype that antiques and collectibles are only for the older generation. Well, not really, because there's Scott Ian of Anthrax with his you know splattered guitar, and uh, this is actually one of the hotter chapters in the book, from what I from what I hear, that um, young collectors love rock and roll. It's timeless. You can still collect you know, great Elvis things. You can collect wonderful uh, contemporary things from you know Nirvana and um, current bands, and that starts to fill the bridge between sellers and buyers and, and collectors of all age groups. Another hot area is gambling memorabilia. You know, we start to see um, a lot of the um, a lot of the, the, the phrase, uh, I'm sorry, the, uh, the trend in Texas Hold'em, that's spilling over into the collectibles now. We're seeing really fantastic prices being paid. Not that long ago, I was talking with uh, Bill Morford, who uh, auctions high quality advertising, and he said one of his great surprises this year, and even from last year, was that gambling memorabilia is through the roof. You just can't keep a hold of it. And there are some really great collections being developed all across the U.S. as items start to come out of attics. Another great area for antiques is rare tools, and even tools in general. Um, sometimes we're seeing these tools uh, that are some of these tools that are used. Uh, we also see them increasingly uh, older tools be hung on the wall for artwork, and it's kind of an interesting departure. But there's a lot of interest out there. Um, this tool sold for $114,000. Um, we're seeing interest in the antique tool business. Um, Brown tool auctions just recently changed hands. Um, and you're going to see um, a new revitalization of that business. And uh, so you're seeing some activity in these markets that may not have had a lot of activity for a while. But they're starting to, to, uh, start to see some green shoots. Another area is animals and vintage taxidermy. There's um, a lot of interest in vintage Victorian taxidermy, and uh, one of the, the collectors that is featured in the book actually fills his home full of different items that he finds and kind of decorates them and, and, and dresses them up a little bit. So and yes, that's a that's a bronze alligator with a marquetry tray smoking a cigar. Because why the heck not? Um, again, it comes down to a little bit of humor and. Um, and uh, kind of making people smile and have a conversation piece. Uh, the nostalgia for vintage clothing is super hot right now. We're seeing a lot of um, uh, great uh, pieces of vintage clothing change hands at a better rate. Um, these are 
uh, some fantastic flight jackets um, that sold recently. But we're also seeing interest in uh, really brand name makers such as uh, Hermes and Tiffany and Louis Vuitton. Uh, those areas can always seem to find a buyer. Um, and in fact, a couple of years ago, there was a dealer on the show circuit that was taking older Louis Vuitton leather and using it to cover everything from you know, baby buggies to bicycle seats and uh, finding a really strong trade. So those are the type of antiques that you can only find on the show circuit. Um, so you're seeing this, these really unusual collections come out. Another area that's really hot is uh, collecting uh, technology and vintage video games. Right now, as we speak, there is a auction going on on uh, Game Gavel for the world's largest video game collection. It just went up for sale. It's got another three days left. And right now, I checked it just before we started, the bid was $750,000 uh, for 11,000 piece collection. That's some real money. <laughs> I mean, if you're looking at some in the, in the Keep it perspective um, when heritage auctions uh, offered up the uh, the largest archive of uh, uh, Pierre Renoir's personal effects, they carry the same sort of estimate. Um, that's the type of money that we're talking about here. Uh, big dollars from a new generation that's interested in capturing a part of their childhood. Um, the uh, video game there you see is extremely rare. Uh, recently sold on eBay for forty-one thousand dollars. Again, you're talking some serious interest from hardcore collectors. Um, another hot area is always, you know, racing memorabilia. Uh, sex always sells. Um, we see we see it here at, uh, at Heritage with the sale of um, some of the quality pinup art from the 50s that captures a pop culture era uh, that uh, that uh, will never be repeated again. And you see it. We also hear from shop owners too that. Um, Really vintage quality vintage things are always always have a have a market. So once we start talking about the item, you know, now that we look at some of the items that are real hot, um, it's interesting to see how collectors pull these items together. And what dazzled me the most about antiques was the lengths that some collectors will go to to display their collections. So this is the collector I found in Indiana. Um, yeah, he loves his Hot Wheels. Um, I don't know quite how he got away from this, uh, got away with this, but um, I heard that his uh, wife said he could he could collect all he wanted, but he had to keep it out of the out of the upstairs and try not to clutter the basement. So he's pretty innovative, and he kind of uh, plastered his wall. Um, but this is the kind of uh, kind of really dedicated, um, uh, transcendent collections that you see. Uh, that my antique collectors maintain. Um, another hot area, and a, a fellow that's featured in the book, uh, is uh, Carlos Cardoza. He puts mid-century modern, and it's interesting because uh, Carlos lives inside of his collection. He's got everything he owns is tied to this area. His house is an original uh, mid-century modern uh, ranch. Um, it, uh, you know, he's got a 54 pink Cadillac. Everything about his collection is tied to more on one single theme, and uh, you can never go too far. Um, but sometimes, uh, yeah, there, there is no such thing as going too far. <laughs> um, so another hot area um, that is turning up with some really great collections is uh, Victorian Gothic. Um, you know, maybe it's tied to the influence from uh, oddities, uh, the, the television show. Um, but these type of areas kind of fall into the gentleman collector sphere and you see uh, interesting pursuits for you know a really quality uh, uh, Victorian and Edwardian collectibles that just a few years ago were having a really tough time finding a market for. There's a revival going on and we're seeing that at shops all over. Uh, sports memorabilia again um, some of the collectors that I spoke to for the book and uh, profiles um, really take their collection seriously, whether it ranges from contemporary items to vintage pieces. Um, this this collection was actually owned by uh, Gary Seedenfrau, um, and he was present at the Sotheby's auction when his good friend Barry Helper sold his collection. And um, you know, you see these collections when they come up, they really become history-making events because you don't get a chance to see these collections 
develop anymore in our lifetime, there's a pretty good chance that no other collector will have the opportunity and the, uh, the gift of history uh, that uh, the some of these collectors have to assemble these items and pass them on to other collectors. So another thing you see in the Mantis realm is a lot of young collectors. So the young collectors really want Mantis. This is Benny Hinkle the third. Um, he's a single dad um, raising his son in the middle of a, of a 1,000 square foot curiosity cabinet. So in this situation, the young collector isn't so isn't uh, driven so much for accumulating items, but for hand selecting really unique pieces and then researching them and understanding their history. So while Benny raises his son, the two of them are going out and shopping together and finding things and then researching things together and really getting a good understanding of um, the history behind the items. And that's something that the two of them share. They kind of spend hours shopping and then they also spend time, hours researching together on the internet and um, to uh, the, the reference library. So it's very cool. Um, but Benny kind of represents the new type of collector that we're seeing uh, not just in the hobby, but we're seeing a, a new approach to masculinity um, across the United States. And, you know, I've got my own personal ideas on why that, that's happening. Um, and it kind of it's kind of tied to technology. Um, you see the rise of popularity of, of books like The Art of Manliness and, um, you know, Esquire and GQ are, are still going strong with that strong readership. Um, I think it's because the modern day male is trying to and, you know, try to redefine what masculinity is. And uh, I think greater emphasis of technology has kind of pushed us into a period where, you know, we're to redefine what it means to be a man and, and what, what are manly things. You know, we don't have to, we're not in the, in, the, uh, in the era of nation building necessarily here anymore. Our generation isn't called to defend the greater good sometimes. So when we start to look at our free time, we start to try to find a a stronger definition of what masculinity is, and it's, and it's spilling over into our hobbies. Um, but it's also become more socially acceptable for guys to become collectors in, in a grander scheme, um, in a pursuit that wasn't always that was always generally reserved for um, you know the, the ultra wealthy. That's not so, so, that's not so the case anymore. So, young collectors um, who are into antiques, uh, they crave the unique. Um, few people want to collect the whole set. You know, they're um, they're looking for things that um, are really uh, are really distinctive. Uh, this is a rare, um, you know, uh, British World War One anti-shrapnel tank mask. Um, had a lot of interest when it came up. It's kind of gruesome looking, but it's a really important historical piece. And and um, there are some that say that that young and modern collectors um, are not as aware of history or have a solid understanding of history. I think that, you know, it's, it's easy to, to criticize young collectors because they, they may not have the shared experiences, but they're a smart group. They're going to college in greater numbers. They've got a strong intellectual pursuit. And um, that's one of the reasons why um, I wrote Mantis to cater to young collectors. Um, they know what they're, what they're looking for. They're fascinated by unique items and they're, uh, they're pursuing them now. Uh, young Mantis collectors really want stories. Uh, they want uh, interesting stories tied to their items, and kind of like like we all, you know. That's uh, that's one of the great reasons why we've always like um, a lot of the collectors in the book. Um, you know, say that they found some of their best stuff at auctions or at shows. Did you get a chance to meet with people? You get a chance to learn their the history of an item, and uh, learn a little bit about what the dealer uh, went through to find it. That's always interesting. So, um, but Mantis collectors, they, they, they like to have um, interesting stories that they can tie to each piece. So, for instance, the, uh, the September Morn, the watch frog there, um, is uh, it's kind of a kind of interesting story. And it's, it's something that I encountered in the book in one of the collections that, um, that we covered. Um, but this is a perfect example of a more common item that collectors are seeking because of the story behind it. So if for those of you who don't know the September Morn story, it was a it was a painting by a French artist Paul Chabas. Um, he painted it, uh, painted it from 1910 to 1912. 
Um, it was displayed, a print was displayed in the Chicago Gallery in uh, 1912. Um, it was deemed too shocking to be on public display. Uh, the mayor of Chicago um, charged the gallery with indecency. The art uh, dealer won the case in court and it made the, fame, made the, paint, the painting famous. Um, suddenly, everyone across the nation wanted this painting and um, orders went through the roof. And it became it started to appear on a lot of different items through the first quarter of the 20th century. So you see things with the September morn that uh, that uh, you know that painting might get lost to history, but that story lingers a little bit, and people really get a chance to research and they appreciate that. And um, antiques collectors love that stuff. And it, it, we're not talking very expensive items. This watch fob you know is worth about 75 bucks, 75 to 100 bucks. Um, and it's a really cool collection, collectible, um, and nice addition. The aluminum strut is another good example of an item that uh, that uh, it comes with a great story. This is from the Malcolm S. Forbes collection. Um, Heritage Auctions offered it in 2011, and this is an aluminum strut from the Hindenburg Zeppelin um, from the disaster, and it was uh, fashioned into a, into a stool. Uh, that's a type of collectible that that wealthy will uh, that the wealthy will pursue. But um, the rest of us are grateful that, they, that these items are, are preserved. So you see that there's two different categories uh, in price, but they have something in common. They've got a wonderful story behind them. So now that we talked about what they are, we've got to find out where to find them, right? So we've got um, the two biggest um, yeah, sources that came up was um, shops and group malls. Um, and also themed auctions. So you look at um, the uh, the amount of shops that have opened up um, in the U.S. Um, has kind of dropped uh, for general uh, and, and, uh, antiques, but the number of antiques shops have actually risen. Um, you see some really great things coming in, and um, here's a good example. Um, this is from the introduction. You look at the number of uh, shops that have popped up across the nation. And you see the commonalities from coast to coast. Uh, these shops are not only opening, they've opened in the last, say, decade, from, uh, from 2002, I'd say maybe 12 years. Uh, not only are they open, but they're thriving. They're catering to an unusual uh, collector base. And uh, uh, so they're seeing um, a lot of really interesting things come through. Um, so, one of the ways that the, um, the auction business has uh, capitalized on this is by heart is by holding themed auctions, and it kind of goes back to what we said earlier: of seeking knowledgeable dealers and knowledgeable sources for really unusual things. So that's why shops and shows are so important, and why themed auctions have also been uh, are also so important because you get a chance to to um, benefit from the knowledge that these auctioneers and um, directors kind of share and bring to the sale. So Heritage launched um, in spring of 2011 its Gentleman Collector Auction, uh, and it launched it with the Malcolm S. Forbes Collection. And we hold that auction now once a year, every fall, and so do other uh, auction houses. And um, it's strictly catered around the Gentleman Collector, Gentleman Luxury Accessories and Objects, and things like that. So. Um, this is a, a, a motorized scale model of a Bugatti uh, that's sold for thirteen thousand. And uh, again, it's one of the really unusual, different things you can actually ride in that guy. Um, it's one of the unusual things that you see that people are collecting these days in a greater, greater frequency. So Christie's is, uh, as well now holds a uh, an, uh, an auction once a year uh, called Out of the Ordinary. Um, it's kind of a, a combination of a lot of different items that don't fit other collect, you know, don't fit other categories, but it appeals to um, a more masculine collector. Um, some really unusual stuff. eBay is, uh, is, is the uh, is the nation's addict, I guess you could say. Um, is a great source for these items. Um, it's kind of tougher on eBay to find what you're looking for. I mean, you've got to be very specific. Um, it doesn't really show you well, things that you didn't know you wanted, which you see at shops and malls and, um, and at auctions. So, and then you also kind of lose that social component, but 
Um, if you're looking for a certain item um, and you know exactly what you're looking for, then that's a great source tool. So the sellers that you meet are just as strange as the collectors sometimes. Um, they're also just as intelligent. They've got a really strong background um, of, uh, they've got a strong and diverse background in the areas that they've uh, that they specialized in. Um, this, uh, it's kind of surprising when you start to talk with the dealers of the antiques, um, you find out quickly that they are not career, um, collect, they're not clear, career dealers, they might be collectors. So this is Robert Owen, uh, he was a mechanical engineer before he opened DFW Mantiques uh, two years ago. And uh, he opened it with his uh, partner, uh, Compton Creel. So um, the shop hold, the shop holds, uh, holds your inventory and also a uh, small selection of hand-picked dealers that carry truly uh, distinctive items. And uh, it's also a great gig, uh, the, antiques, the antiques shops, it's a great gig for partners. So this is uh, Bill uh, Paisano and uh, Will Murphy. Uh, they're 30-somethings who quit really stable jobs in the middle of an economic downturn um, to sell collectibles. And it's something that they had always wanted to do. Uh, they're based in New Hampshire. They, um, uh, they, uh, they did it on a leap of faith. They were featured in the book. And they represent a lot of the trends that we're seeing in the market. They're young guys interested in selling old stuff. And uh, they're bringing a new approach to how they do it, and they're succeeding. And that's a big part. So, so how did these shops um, succeed when a lot of other general shops are closing? I think one of the reasons is that they um, they bring a lot of the aspects of antiques to the shop. They've got humor. They've got um, you know they carry unusual things. Um, and most importantly, though, I think that they, they speak to their customers. They find out what their customers are after. They also um, are not afraid to carry things that maybe a general antique shop might not want to carry. Um, they also um, embark in a couple of different projects and, and marketing efforts that help them stand apart. So, um, for instance, at DFW Antiques, when you, um, when you mosey in, you're offered a free beer from uh, their, their kegerator that's up near the the uh, front of the store. You know, it's, a, it's, a, it's a nice six inch, six, uh, six ounce cold beer, and you get the chance to, to browse some really great stuff. Um, you know, having, having a drink, it's been, it's been very good. It's been very, a very good way to help them stand apart. Um, there's a, a Mantique shop in Janesville that offers, Janesville, Wisconsin, that offers uh, vintage video game nights. And they hook they hook up a bunch of uh, uh, vintage video game consoles, and they invite their uh, their customers to play Super Mario Brothers um, into the night as a way to kind of bring young collectors together and even some curious older older collectors. So another thing I've noticed too in a lot of uh, antique shops is that they keep funny price tags. They bring they inject a little humor into the shopping experience and really kind of let the customer be uh, comfortable. And uh, for a lot of collectors, and I hear this over and over, a lot of collectors see, feel that shops or auctions are very intimidating. They don't know how to do. They worry that if they, if they scratch their nose, they're going to end up buying a, buying a you know, $2,000 couch. It's not always that way. Um, and whatever the shop owner or auctioneer can do to make the customer feel at, at ease it really goes a long way. So another common denominator you see among all these shops, um, and even auctions now, is affordability. You see a wide range of items at wide price points. Um, so there, you know, at some shops you see items that are around fifty dollars to as much as five hundred dollars or even more. Um, you know, their items are clearly priced and clearly marked, so there's no questions. It saves on. Uh, on the, uh, on the shop owner running around answering questions all the time. And uh, you see over and over again when you talk to dealers that although a lot of customers are, in, are looking for the, um, you know, the $100 to $50 range, those collectors come back and uh, return and then they start to trade up. And that 
it's at, it's, it's at that point where the dealer or the auctioneer can start to take a more intimate relationship with the customer and say, you know, if you if you really want to start trading up, here's here are the things that you want to look for to start to build a really quality collection. So although you know it's hard to find anybody's going to walk in off the street um, and drop ten thousand dollars in your store, um, there is a way to maintain to develop a relationship with your customers even at these lower price points and start to encourage them and, and, and give them the confidence to start buying buying different things. So um, one of the ways that these shops are succeeding um, in the 21st century is through the internet. Um, it's been a really phenomenal uh, boom to the business. I've always said that the arrival of eBay uh, created more collectors and uh, sellers of, uh, of antiques than ever before. Um, the arrival of the internet leveled the playing field for a lot of folks. It redefined what the word rare meant. And you saw wonderful things come out. Um, and, and in a way, you know, from our vantage point um, here at Heritage Auctions, we're seeing um, the, the number of collector, the, the number of really phenomenal collections that are coming out now rivals that of uh, the mid '90s when eBay uh, was developed. But um, so the antique sellers are we were already, you know, well, you know, 15, 20 years into the um, internet age, and they've quickly adapted. Here's a, a antique seller in uh, in uh, uh, Georgia, just north of uh, Atlanta. So he's got his Facebook page developed. Um, he's got a website logo developed. He's got all of his information that he needs for um, the customer to figure out when they can show up and start shopping. And in the lower right hand, or lower right hand corner, you can see he's got you know a very active Twitter feed, an Instagram account. And um, he's he's present and uh, uh, the, uh, the the way that he manages these accounts is mainly through photos. He'll snap a ton of photos to the shop and uh, serve it up through uh, Twitter and Instagram. And he's really where the customer is and where they want to be and how they're communicating. So he's adapting his business a little bit. And um, you know, so far, it's, it's really worked. Um, so one of the ways. That another way we're seeing um, antiques sellers succeed is uh, by sitting down and creating a marketing plan, um, and also try to develop some sort of a an event that goes beyond the shop. It doesn't always have to be about moving inventory of, uh, to kind of capture your customer's interest. And when you have a shop, you've got a free stage to um, display and talk about whatever you want. So um, one way we're seeing uh, Dealers find new customers is by holding events, maybe a whiskey tasting. Um, you start with uh, they start with developing a press release, maybe creating a, a Facebook event page. Um, you know, you've got uh, there are free television and calendar announcements, um, and also uh, websites, um, whether they're yours or someone else's. And uh, this new approach to kind of you know, toss up these items in front of people, maybe in an unsuspecting, unsuspecting way, especially through Facebook. Um, it's been very popular with a lot of antique sellers. Um, they're finding new customers, and, uh, and if it's, they're not visiting them in person, then they're calling to inquire about an item that they saw that maybe their friend uh, had shared or liked on Facebook and helped it go viral a little bit. So one way that a lot of these sellers are finding new customers is um, through traditional methods, because even though Social media is very important, and it's changing how we communicate. There are still uh, quality customers to be found through newspaper advertisements and flyers and posters. And one uh, one method in particular is um, postcards. And it's surprising to see how effective a postcard is sent through the mail, especially from an antique shop, whether they're printed and um, and uh, stamped. Branded, or even if they're vintage cards that are mailed, uh, a lot of tourists don't like that. But um, but when you get a, a postcard in the mail, it really helps your business stand out. Remember, there's a shop, um, a shop called Great Estates in Central Wisconsin. Um, they send out sales through postcards, shipping postcards. So for I think it's twenty to forty cents now per customer, 
you, um, you reach the customer and for a split second you capture their attention by holding something physical in their hands. Um, so it, it also, and by sending postcards too, it tells you, uh, you know, how often your customers are willing to return for advertised discounts. Um, and it's also a great way to stay, you know, keep top of mind awareness with them any day of the week. Um, they may not be active on Facebook or, or Twitter that week, but um, they're going to check their mail. And um, it's just one more quick way, an affordable way that you can stay connected with them. So another um, ask, another uh, tactic you can, you, can, uh, you can adopt if you're not particularly uh, creative in this realm, then you can always jump on a website you know, like, like Elance. And for 100 bucks or so, or, or two or three, you can find a freelance graphic designer um, to help you work up a, a marketing campaign or um, a logo and help you develop some uh, some collateral and send it out to your customers. So it's very easy to um, to get a, a big bang for not a lot of marketing dollars. But one way um, that uh, Will and Bill um, reached out was they capitalized on any opportunity they could. Um, when they were mentioned in the book, they reached out to their local newspaper and let them know that they were um, in the book. Um, and uh, it resulted in a great article in the hometown newspaper. And I sure hope that it uh, generated a lot of foot traffic in their shop. And uh, so it was flattering to see, and it was a really smart use of their time to kind of reach out and say, hey, we are unique um, just for the fact that we're antique sellers. And um, it was smart of them to kind of capitalize on the trend and find some ways to, uh, to bring in some, some traffic. So, and uh, with that, we can open up the floor to some questions. Great. Hey, thanks, Eric. That was terrific. We do have some questions, so let me just kind of uh, run through uh, a few of these for you. Um, this is this is absolutely one of my favorite questions that came through. Do you ever wonder about the mental health of some of these collectors? Paul wants to know. <laughs> well, well, I can not not publicly, <laughs> but um, but. Uh, it is interesting to see um, the links that collectors will go to. Um, you know, and early in the in the discussion of antiques, or early in the introduction, you know, I, I kind of advise uh, folks to uh, to make sure that your finances are are separate uh, from your collecting budget, um, because it's it sure is easy to come across some great stuff and find yourself short on the mortgage. I've heard of some stories uh, about that and. You know, plus you, you, you know, reduce the risk that you're going to have orders knocking on your door to take a camera in your face and you're going to spend prime time. But, uh, you know, you do, um, it does take a certain type of person who's willing to uh, love an era, an era or an item so much that they uh, fill their home to the rafters with the items. And, and a lot of the collectors that are featured in the book, um, the photo spreads that are uh, that depict their collection, you see that they can still function <laughs> in a normal way. Yeah. But um, they just become menageries of really phenomenal stuff. Great. Uh, let's see. This one uh, comes from Paul uh, as well. He wants to know, um, your book is filled with a lot of amazing collectibles. Do you have favorites? Are there areas you would recommend to collect? Um, you know, I... A safe answer would be to uh, to collect what you like, and I always advise that. But if you're looking for you know resale potential, um, you really have to focus on the areas that are that are that are really popular and that have long long staying power. So like you know rock and roll, um, I see that that is a really strong area for the future. Um, you see, uh, art is, is still a really strong area. Um, one area that I don't think is going to go away anytime soon is, and is just beginning to be recognized as a strong collecting area is uh, vintage technology. Um, you know, we're seeing uh, dedicated auction houses um, reach into the six figures with their sales. Um, you know, Heritage just recently offered the uh, Glenn Reed collection of mechanical models, and it was stored in a museum in Detroit, and it brought $1.2 million. Those are some really dedicated collectors that are spending serious cash to own um, um, pieces that kind of represent um, you know, gone really important eras in, in uh, mankind's development of the machine. So, so 
there are areas that are really strong, but at the end of the day, you really have to collect what you like. You know, if you're really right. into, into, into taxidermy and you really want to own a you know, you know taxidermy and weird weird items, you really want to own a two headed canary, you know, I say go for it because life's too short and as long as you go into it knowing that you know your the overall market for a two headed canary is a bit thin, um, you can still enjoy it and uh, you can have some fun with it. Great. Hey, uh, and then perhaps uh, Greg uh, <laughs> has an interest in this as well, but he wants to know, I have a lot of old booze bottles uh, <laughs> that are still full, oh. which is surprising in itself. Um, and he wants to know, how, how do I go about selling those? Well, Greg, I can, I can help you empty those <laughs> when the time comes, but uh, it's funny you mentioned that because um, just this month, um, uh, a, a really popular magazine uh, here in the South, we're located, we're located in Dallas, just ran a feature on collecting vintage whiskeys. And this collector took a really unique approach and kind of a, you know, a path of least resistance. He collected strictly Kentucky bourbons and whiskeys in the original bottle, preferably unopened, um, but, it, and he focused on just pre-prohibition bottles. So he had about five, about 150 in his collection, and uh, it looks it looks fantastic. It's kind of an interesting pursuit. He'll, he'll you know he admitted to paying up to around three or four hundred dollars for a full bottle of pre-prohibition whiskey uh, that he didn't have in his collection. And uh, you know it takes a lot of self-control to stare at that much, you know you know as like to call them little erasers in the blackboard of life, and not crack into them. But um, but it really does serve as a as a reminder of some some of the links that these collectors go to. So there is a market out there for those items, and um, you know sometimes I hear that uh, that dealers may might lament on who's going to buy these things. Well, there is a way to reach them if you are willing to you know try social media and try a couple different things. And there's collectors for everything. Great. Uh, let's see. Uh, Mike is asking, how do new trends like steampunk and industrial decor factor into the Mantiques trend? Uh, you know, I wish I had twice as many pages in this book, because um, steampunk would have been a great one to, to include, and I really wanted to do it. But um, uh, steampunk, I think, is is a very, very it, when I think of steampunk, I think of it in the same sense that maybe our grandparents saw the colonial revivalism of the 20s and 30s when you saw that the you know the the revival of the furniture that was popular in uh, the colonial period or the revolutionary period come back in the 20s and it was built you know you saw the chippendale-esque furniture that was affordably made um we're in the middle of that that revival now and i think 40 or 50 years from now Steampunk still isn't going stronger and stronger. You'll see if people look back and really start to collect these really fantastic objects that people have created. And I think it's going to elevate to an art form if it hasn't already considered it among you know, secondary collectors. But I would not at all be surprised if in 25 years you see people seeking out steampunk creations from a few notable artisans that are active right now that are building, you know, whether they're helmets or, or hats or vests or you know, you know, spooky looking canes, it kind of depends on, but um, I would not be surprised. It's a really hot area and it's really another one that's attracting a lot of young people, so I say, oh, more power to it. Great. A couple more for you. Uh, Nancy's interested in uh, the tobacco category, specifically smoking pipes and cigarette lighters. Certainly those are mantique. Absolutely, and that's one of the collections that um, Benny collects, and we was um, he was uh, generous enough to kind of show us through his entire home and up his staircase into his two bedrooms. He's got his uh, his uh, hallway leading upstairs is covered in smoking memorabilia and cigar memorabilia. So you see on the on the table there underneath the mannequin head, he's got some you know plates with the popular craft back in the day. Uh, cigar bands that were were put under you know, uh, translucent um, dishes, um, 
but um, Benny's a cigar smoker. Um, he uh, invites his friends over. They do uh, one one night a week. They'll they'll crack out some cigars and kind of enjoy the enjoy the living room. Um, he's uh, he's look, always looking to trade up. And interesting and interestingly enough, that uh, his interest in Tavakiana uh, spans not just the cigar and um, pipe smoking, but also into different paraphernalia. So on one side of his room, he's got a cabinet full of great Majolica pieces that are really devoted to just smoking um, and, and tobacco pieces. So um, so you start to see, you know, that's you know starting to cross the lines of a lot of different genres. And when these collections come together, um, it's the great. But yeah, tobacco, tobacco collecting is really hot. Great. Hey, uh, one one last question for you, um, and this comes from Kevin. He said, "Would you address the values that we see on those TV shows, Pawn Stars, Pickers, etc., and what we as dealers can expect from the public, uh, and how to counter the perceptions?" I'm sure that is a big, big thing that you see on the heritage side as well. Yeah, we, and it's it's one of those things where, you know, um, one of the best things you can say is. You know, even though Antiques Roadshow or American Pickers or Pawn Stars might feature, you know, 20 fantastic items in an hour, the reality is that they sort through literally a convention center full of items. So you're talking, I think, uh, the last count, Antiques Roadshow gives out 7,000 tickets, and they boil that down into 20 or 30 items for features on the show and on the web. So I didn't even know the math on that. It's like you know, point zero zero one percent of the items that come through that can make it. Um, so it's very hard. Uh, you know, it's a perennial problem, um, and not so much a problem, but a challenge. And it's also a good learning opportunity. But um, as sellers, um, there is a choice that you can make when you encounter that. And it's and I see this when you talk to the Manti sellers. You can either get testy with them. And say, you know, I don't have time for that. Um, it's not worth it. Or you can use it as a learning opportunity to kind of educate them, and um, you know, encourage them. You know, maybe, maybe pull up examples. You know, either at at what you know, a good example is at Worth Point. Pull up examples of the items that are sold. Um, Worth Point has a stellar database, um, and you kind of show them. You say, here's the here's where your item is, and here's some examples of what it sold in the past. You kind of show them why, but. I tell you what, I've got nothing but respect for dealers that have to deal with that day in and day out. I know it's got to be um, frustrating. You see it at shows, um, and you see it at the shop, but um, you never know when that customer who comes in with, um, you know, with curiosity but ignorance can turn into a really great collector that you can cultivate and help grow and, and benefit your business in his life. Yes. Great. Well, thank you. Uh, let's uh, let's. I, I know there's a couple other questions, and I'll pass those uh, pass those along to Eric so that uh, we can get you some answers and, and send those back to you. Uh, Eric, let's let's uh, share with them what we've got here. So uh, everybody now wants to get the book just so they can go through the rest of the photos. I'm sure. So I think you've worked out that there is a discount code through KrausBooks.com. Right. They were uh, the publisher's been generous enough to um, offer a discount um, at uh, you visit CrowseyBooks.com and uh, you can order the book for uh, sixteen bucks and get free shipping. That's a very generous offer. Great. So that code is Man Ten, and then we also have the same code here at Worth Point Man Ten, and invite you to uh, to visit the site there. And um, we're going to uh, take three dollars off the monthly subscription price, the membership price, so it'll be $16.99 per month. So uh, again, we encourage you to, to visit both of those. Uh, we have chosen a winner for the autographed Mantiques book and a one-year Worth Point membership, and that's Scott Pritchard. So uh, hopefully Scott stayed with us, I think so. And uh, Scott, we'll reach out to you and get some information so we can get everything over to you. I want to thank you, Eric, for uh, participating today. Sure, sure was nice hearing all about this and um, finding out what Mantix is all about right before Father's mm -hmm. Day. So now I know exactly what to get my dad. <laughs> well, and thank uh, you, Yeah, we certainly uh, appreciate everyone else who attended. Remember that you should be receiving an email 
tomorrow that'll have a link to the recorded version for some of you I know there was a, a little hard uh, time hearing there at the beginning but you'll have uh, all that information and we'll also uh, in include uh, a uh, email address where if you want to reach out to to uh, Eric directly you can do that as well Again, thank you very much for attending. Thank you, Eric, and uh, we'll see you guys the next time we're on. Thank you, Pam.